All right, friends, thanks for coming tonight. Glad you're here. And, uh, you know, uh, just to begin, our denomination has been in uh, really a uh, institutional mess since really 2012. Uh, that general, that year's general conference just simply ended in a, uh, a, a brouhaha. And then 2016 was even worse. Um, and uh, so the, the nomination had just been stalemated uh, at the highest levels um, for uh, almost 10 years now. Now, in one sense, that doesn't impact St. Mark's a lot. We've continued to do, you continue to do ministry. We've continued to do ministry together. We have worship every Sunday. We, uh, uh, you know, and our, our church council has functioned and, and everything. Um, where the real issues lie is when we, when uh, uh, pastoral transitions and new pastors come, old pastors leave, and um, up until this time, up until the last 10, 15 years, um, I hate to say us United Methodist pastors were interchangeable, but there was a common core of uh, uh, what you could expect to get from a United Methodist preacher. And, and uh, it's to the point now in some annual conferences where you really uh, you can get two vastly different takes on scripture, two vastly different theological frameworks, and um, uh, that itself will wreak havoc on churches uh, as pastors come and pastors go. So, um, all that to say is uh, this has been brewing for a while. It's really been brewing for 50 years uh, since the, the founding of uh, the merger between the Evangelical United Brethren and the Methodist Church in 1968. Uh, in 1972, that general conference had its first open debate on issues regarding human sexuality. So this is not something new. It's been happening in the church, um, and uh, uh, but it's at a point now where general conference can't, doesn't, doesn't have the means and can't uh, correct itself, and the denomination can't correct itself, and uh, and and that's what Tom's going to focus on. How did we get to be where we are today, and why 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 are we in a mess? Uh, so as so to, so with that being said, tonight we're not going to talk about is homosexuality right uh, or wrong. Uh, what does the Bible say? If if at, at the end, if you want to have a session on that, I'll be glad to lead that, and uh, I'll try to give you both sides, but that's that's not what we're dealing with tonight. Uh, what we're dealing with tonight is, why is the denomination in a mess, and uh, why can't it fix itself? And I think Tom has done a tremendous amount of research, and uh, uh, I think you'll come away understanding the dilemma in a much better and deeper way tonight. Does that make sense? Yes. Very good. There will be some time for questions afterwards. Tom can answer just about anything you can throw at him. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> uh, no, be kind to him. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can, uh, and, and you know, we we can all. You know, this is a highly emotional issue. I understand that. And uh, uh, we're dealing with things that um, uh, have been, are, are really a, the cause of a lot of pain as well as deep thinking in a lot of people's lives and hearts. And um, uh, we want to approach that with as much grace as possible. At the same time, we are the church. And uh, we want to understand what it means to be the church of God and how we move forward from here. So let's begin with prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for your love and grace that you've shown to each and every one of us. We acknowledge that we all stand in the need of your grace, that none of us can come before your throne as we are 
unless you do a work within us and for us. And we're thankful that in Jesus Christ you have done that work and uh, you have brought our hearts together. And so we just pray as we gather in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would come and uh, fill us and fill this place with your presence. Uh, give us understanding and uh, begin to work within us that we might um, follow your way forward. Um, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I give you Mr. Tom Simpson. <laughs> We're here tonight to just give information uh, and take questions, and uh, we'll, we'll do some debating later on. And uh, uh, after you've had a chance to digest a lot of a lot of things, uh, but we're having this session tonight because there's a growing concern regarding the lack of discussion about the possibilities that could result from the next general council. Some members feel strongly that the church should uphold its current stances regarding gay clergy and marriage. Others strongly advocate for inclusion of LGBTQ persons in all aspects of life in the church. These, as Roland said, these differences have been debated, debated for 11 general conferences over 40 years. And after the 2019 general conference, uh, that was supposed to resolve all these issues, things have just gotten worse. So, you, the United Methodist Church, all right, got one. Which one you want? None of that's working. Okay. None of it's working. Working up, it's not working here, but it's working up there. Oh, well, where am I? You are on <laughs> topics for today. What you want the second slide, or you want the general Just information? Did the second one. That one, no, the one before that, one before that. There we go. All right, I was looking here and it wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> I'm so, going to sit right here so that I can help you. So the subtopic to this slide is we fear what we do not understand. So the, one of the objectives tonight is to just make sure that everybody has is on the same page as far as terminology and what the groups of the church do. Um, legislation will be presented whenever the next general conference is held that will propose a separation of the United Methodist Church into one or more denominations, and that's called the Protocol of Reconciliation and Grace Through Separation. And you're going to hear a lot of detail about that later on. But in the end, there's a lot of, of verbiage in there about how this decision will come about. But in the very final say it's going to come down to the local church deciding which way that you want to go. So the objective of today is for or each of us just to have a better understanding regarding the current situation and be better prepared to make decisions going forward. So today, how did I do this like that? Yeah. Today, Today's presentation, there won't be any reference to scripture. Uh, and like as Roland said, when you're discussing this issue with others, just be very respectful because it is a highly emotional issue with some. Uh, I'd ask that you hold any questions until the end so I can get through this in, in 35 minutes or so. And we'll set aside a set of time for debate later on. So Going forward, it's just important to have a basic understanding of the United Methodist Church organization, the duties and responsibilities of, of the groups. Um, 
some of us have been Methodists for a long time. I joined the Methodist Church when I was 13. And to be honest with you, I really didn't know anything about the Methodist Church for 40 years. Uh, I'm a fourth generation Methodist, and I just, that's what we were. And I didn't question it. So uh, I guess really at, uh, when I became a, a, a delegate at the annual conference when Alan and I went up a couple of years ago, a uh, really eye-opener as to kind of what, I, I voted on people to go to a jurisdictional conference. I'll be honest with you, I had no idea what that was. So we're going to talk about what some of the groups do. Uh, and I struggled when putting this presentation together about where to start. Because like I said, I know some of us have been United Methodists a long time, some of us are new to the, new to the denomination. So, I wanted everybody to start on a, laying pl a level playing field. So what we're going to discuss today is, is how we got ourselves into this situation in the first place. I'm going to talk about what we say versus what we do as United Methodists today. We'll talk about the protocol for reconciliation and, gra and grace through separation and what are the choices under the protocol. So the first graphic <clears throat> shows to the right of the screen, it says United Methodists, a connected church. And all of these circles intersect with each other, which implies that all these organizations are connected. So we'll go through each of these and, and give in general terms what the responsibilities of each one of these different groups are. Um, and their basic function. That way, whenever uh, you see a news release coming out over the next months and years, if you see something that says General Conference did this or uh, Council of Bishops did this, you'll have a basic understanding of what those, those groups are. So the first one is a General Conference. You can think about that as like maybe the House of Representatives. They're the legislative body. They're the only body that speaks for the United Methodist Church, and they establish the rules and the doctrine of the church. Holston Conference, which we're in, sends 12 delegates to the General Conference. It's scheduled to meet once every four years, but as there was in 2019, the bishops can call a special session. Um, it's. There's 862 delegates that will go to the 20, they're supposed to go to the 2020 General Conference. Of those, 278 are from Africa. And that's not the first time you're going to hear the word Africa mentioned because the United Methodist Church is growing by leaps and bounds in Africa. Uh, the United States, in comparison, has 482 uh, delegates to the General Conference. So the General Conference was supposed to be scheduled in 2020, and all this legislation was supposed to be presented then, but of course because of COVID, it was delayed, and it delayed again in 2021. It's now scheduled for August 29th to September 6th, 2022, and there's already some discussion it could be delayed again. annual conference. St. Mark's is in Holston Annual Conference, one of 54 annual conferences in the United States. What, basically all I knew when I was growing up that pastors were appointed during annual conference because I know it used to be broadcast on the radio back when I was eight or nine years old and everybody in my family gathered around the radio at my grandfather's house and found out who their pastor was going to be. So that's kind of how I grew up uh, in the Methodist Church. But the Holston Conference, you can see, goes from North Georgia to Southwest Virginia. So it covers all those, all those different uh, areas. Uh, there's nearly 1,000 pastors and 154,000 members 
in the Houston Conference. Uh, there's 72 churches in Houston Conference, and St. Mark's is in the Smoky Mountain District, uh, and it's one of nine uh, districts in the, in the Houston Conference. The Judicial Council. You can think of a Judicial Council as kind of like the Supreme Court. It's supposed to decide matters of constitution that the General Con Conference actions take. Uh, there's nine members, laity and clergy, that's elected by the General Conference, and they're elected for eight-year terms. They're also supposed to review bishops' dis decisions of law. In other words, they're supposed to hold the bishops accountable for following the Book of Discipline. The Council of Bishops includes all active and retired United Methodist bishops. They provide oversight for the whole church, and they may call a special session of the General Conference at any time. A jurisdictional conference as I said earlier, I really didn't know what that was. But the jurisdictional conference is the ones who elect and assign bishops to their jurisdictional area. We're going to be talking about a lot of that, uh, how that came about in just a second. Uh, but the main thing you need to remember is they elect and assign bishops. As you'll notice, the jurisdictional conferences, there's five in the United States, and they're by region. Holston Conference, of course, is in the southeastern uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the southeastern uh, jurisdiction uh, has 182 delegates to the general conference. That's the most delegates of any jurisdiction in the Methodist Church. Anybody care to guess who has the second most delegates to the General Conference? Congo. Congo in Africa has 152. That lets you see the influence of the African Methodist Church has on the whole church as itself. So these are all the churches, are all the uh, annual conferences in the southeastern jurisdiction. You can see uh, they're basically in the southeast, east Kentucky to Florida to Georgia. But in order to expl explain the jurisdictional conferences of how it originated, I need to go back all the way to 1844 when the Methodist Episcopal Church split in the north and south. 75 years after the Civil War, they decided that it might be time to get back together. So, in 1939, they decided to come back together. I want to, I, it's important to understand what the structure was prior to 1939. The General Conference was basically the executive, the judicial, and the legislature branch all in one. They assigned the bishops, they appointed the bishops, and the bishops and the conferences were accountable back up to the general conference. In other words, if a bishop or an annual conference got out of line, the general conference would call them to task. In 1939, when they merged, Notice a difference in the accountability. Each jurisdiction appointed and assigned their own bishops. And in the same light, the bishops were accountable only back up to the jurisdiction that appointed them. The general conference had no direct line of authority over any of these jurisdictional conferences. It's basically, remember, 75 years after the Civil War, 1939, the North didn't trust the South, the South didn't trust the North, and neither one of them probably didn't want a bishop assigned to them from the General Conference 
they wanted to appoint and assign their own bishops to their own part of the country. So there was one other jurisdiction that in the United States that was established in, the 1930, in 1939. All black churches from New Hampshire to Florida to Colorado were put in the same, in a central jurisdiction. In other words, when this, this post-1939 organization was put together, it was actually based on distrust and racism. That's the only way I can, I can view it. So what could go wrong? I mean, there's no accountability and, it, and the organization's put together based on uh, the, the wrong reasons. <clears throat> so and another thing that happened in that 1939 uh, reorganization is bishops were now appointed for life. There was no term limits or any restrictions and they only appointed as I've mentioned, back up to the people that, uh, that elected them in that, in that jurisdiction. So let's go over some, just a, a bit of demographics of the United Methodist Church. You'll see here that, uh, and this is, uh, this is estimated, uh, the last information I found on the United States was 2019 and on Africa and Philippines and so on was 2017. So it's a bit of mixing apples and oranges, but this is roughly correct. There's about 50% of the members in the United States and about 48% in Africa. So what is the Book of Discipline? I heard about the Book of Discipline from Elsie Murphy about 1990, the Administrative Council wanted to do something and Elsie Murphy says, you can't do that. Book of Discipline says not. Next time I heard about it was we wanted to write some uh, job descriptions. Well, you don't need to do that. Just go look in the Book of Discipline. It tells you what each staff parish committee does. It tells you what the Finance Committee does. So, but it, what the Book of Discipline is supposed to be, it's supposed to, uh, express unity within the Methodist Church and reflect our Wesleyan way of serving Christ through doctrine and discipline Christian life. The, the Book of Discipline is 898 pages long and it's 2719 paragraphs. Now the reason I said that is the re that, that's why they call us Methodists. If you want to do something, you can go to that book and it'll tell you how to do it. So, uh, and really, if you go to church in New York or New Mexico, same book of discipline. You'll see the United Methodist Hymnal probably in, in all those. Uh, but when, you, when we talk about the book of discipline, you don't talk about page number, you talk about paragraph number. So if somebody refers to paragraph 340 in the book of discipline. That's what you need to look for. It's, a, it's identified by paragraphs. So I want to talk about uh, what, what the debate's all about. The United Methodist Church has some affirmations regarding homosexuality. The church affirms that all people are of sacred worth and are equally valuable in the sight of God. Everyone is welcome to worship and actively participate in the life of the churches. Lay persons may become members and live out their faith through the local church without the respect of sexual orientation or practice. What does the book of this one say? Specifically, there's five paragraphs in the Book of Discipline, and I don't want to go through there and read those, but basically it says marriage is defined as between the union of one man and one woman. The Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. There's one other one I want to call your attention to, paragraph 341. 
I'll be referring to it later on. The ceremonies that celebrate homosexual union shall not be conducted by our ministers and shall not be conducted in our churches. I'll give you a second to read through those. Our clergy, before they're ordained as United Methodist clergy, they have to answer some questions. Do you know the general rules of the church? Will you keep them? Have you studied the doctrines of the United Methodist Church? And on question nine, they have to answer this affirmatively. After full examination, do you believe that our doctrines are in harmony with the Holy Scripture? And the answer is, I believe that they are. I saw somewhere that asked the question, has any minister ever been ordained that answered any of these questions uh, opposed to what this prescribed answer? And they said, not, not that they knew of. So just be aware that our ministers had to take, what's it called? It's not an oath. It's an They're oath. called the historic questions. They have to answer the historic questions. It's not an a oath or, or anything like that. So we've covered we've covered this already. This uh, it's been debated for some 50 years. 11 general conferences. Uh, in 2019, the traditional plan passed by a vote of 449 to 374. That's a total of 75 votes that it passed by, and it, it strengthened the uh, church's stance on human sexuality. Uh, and recall how many delegates are from Africa. It, I think it was safe to say that that, that uh, plan would not have passed without strong support from the African de delegation. So the consequences of the 2019 General Conference vote. Anarchy is, is defined as a state of disorder due to non-recognition of authority. And I think that's, that's what we've had since 2019. At least eight regional conferences have ordained clergy in defiance of, of the 2019 decision. And that was a, a number that I saw uh, dated uh, December 16th, 2019. There's probably even more today. Uh, bishops are making, making statements that are in um, uh, conflict with the Book of Discipline. At least three traditional congregations have had their traditional pastors reassigned without notice to the church or the pastor. And there's been several churches that have left the denomination. There's other consequences such as financial First three months of 2021, United States apportionment receipts were down almost $850,000 compared to the same period in 2020. We say that's probably due to COVID. But look at Africa. Same period in Africa, apportionments are up 2.6%. It has to be harder for the folks in Africa to pay their apportionments than it, than it does the United States. Look at just Look at a uh, host on conference, just right here at home. Budget, 9.1 million, collected 7.9 million, maybe due to COVID. But the membership decreased in 2020 by over 2,800 members. Since December 31st, 2015, Membership has degree, decreased in Holson Conference over 9,000 members. So I asked myself, where's the Judicial Council in all this? When well, 2019, the Judicial Council upheld the ord ordination and commissioning of two LGBTQ members 
saying that the approval of a ministerial candidate is binding administrative action that cannot be nullified. I think that speaks for itself. So what general groups have evolved from the debate? Uh, and you'll be hearing these groups uh, mentioned as, as a group, the progressives, the centrists, and the traditionalists. So you, can, you need to understand kind of the basic stances of, of each of these groups. Progressives, and I've listed some of the uh, organizations that are associated with these different groups, uh, UMC Next, or UM Next is the main one, I think, that's, uh, they would allow ordination of LGBTQ ministers and same-sex marriages. Centrist, they don't really have a, a position. They think that people ought to just can all go to church together and it doesn't matter if they believe different things. Uh, they, they basically just want to hold the church together and do, doesn't really matter what the doctrine is. Traditionalists, Western Covenant Association for One, Good News, uh, affirm the current language in the Book of Discipline regarding ordination and marriage. So this is what the big deal is all about. Protocol of Reconciliation and Grace Through Separation. The way that came about, a bishop from Africa named John Yashambu left the 2019 General Conference and he said he just got a calling that we gotta, put, we gotta get together, we gotta pull this together. And he may have been one of the very few people in the whole United Methodist Church could have, get, could have gotten all these people in a room. You gotta remember, feelings in 2019 had gotten heated. They had gotten to the point, they just really didn't like each other and they didn't care to let the other one know it. So Bishop Shambu asked for representatives of all these different factions, progressives, centrists, and traditionalists, to come together. And they did so in the summer of 2019. Um, they weren't in the room long before they knew that they needed a mediator. They, some of them uh, said that it was just hard to sit in the same room with these other other folks because it had just gotten so heated. So they started looking around trying to find a mediator. Well, they didn't just find any mediator. They, they found a guy named Kenneth Feinberg. He is a, a maybe the most respected mediator in the United States. He mediated the BP oil spill in the Gulf. He's the administrator of the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. And He's a Jewish gentleman, and he volunteered his time to come and mediate between these groups in the United Methodist Church. So at the, they, they met for weeks over a period of several months. And in the end, all of these, every single group had to give up something. And they, uh, uh, Mr. Feinberg, just let them know, if you guys don't come together and work this out, somebody else is gonna write the narrative for you. It'll be decided for you one way or the other. So at the end, all of these different groups got together and covenanted to promise, or covenanted to support the protocol and no other. As part of the, uh, the protocol points, and I've got a reference down here at the bottom. Um, I, I encourage each of you to go online and read the whole text from the protocol. Now the next, the interview with the signatories of the protocol was very interesting to me. It kind of gave me an understanding of the give and take process that went on during this mediation. And I remember that paragraph in the Book of Discipline I wanted, I, I pointed out and told you I, I would mention later. I, I, I consulted with Roland on this. I went back and forth. But 
in that interview, you'll hear the president of the Council of Bishops make a completely opposing statement than to what's actually written in the Book of Discipline. So just be aware that you need to just read, listen, and understand. Uh, but what this, what this protocol does is it allows the traditionalists to leave the United Methodist Church and form a new denomination. All of these points were, as I said, they were mediated to give and take. They argued about this in a room for, for days. Uh, but the traditionalist group would get $25 million in the United Methodist funds uh, but it has to be approved in the next general whenever that may be um, so what are the these are the signature signatories of the protocol I just wanted to see who all was in the room that, that agreed to support this and no other and advocate for its, for its approval. On a sad note, I, I can't go any further without mentioning Bishop John Shambu. He was tragically killed in an automobile accident last year. And as I said, I don't think any of this would have been possible without him. So there's a, a give and take in the protocol. Um, I guess the most frequently asked question that I've gotten is, the traditionalists carry the vote, so why are they the ones having to leave? Or not having to leave, but volunteering to leave. Uh, basically, the, uh, the traditionalists decided that they could stay and they could advocate for traditional uh, uh, legislation. They could advocate for stronger enforcement of the Book of Discipline. But in order to do so, they, it would require a constitutional amendment that would require a two-thirds vote to pass. The votes just weren't there to change the Constitution in order to have a stronger enforcement. So the progressives and the centrists said that they're not, they're not leaving, they're gonna stay and advocate for their strongly felt uh, uh, feelings, convictions. Uh, their traditions could do the same, but that just would just destine the United Methodist Church to go straight down the same path that they been going. Uh, so the traditionalists chose to set the church free. The po uh, what's left after the, the traditional leave will be called the post-separation United Methodist Church. Um, and you can see there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, debate about uh, where does the annual conference go? Uh, where does the local churches go after the annual conference decides and all that? But the bottom line is the local church is going to have the final say-so as to what happens to, to the, your church. So this goes through the, the process, and, and these first uh, three, like I said, there's a lot of debate over those, but they really don't, don't matter much because in the end, the local church is going to decide. Uh, the local administrative council will decide. Uh, there'll be a, a, in order to to go to a different denomination. There will have to be a call church conference. The administrative council will decide whether or not a simple majority, in other words, 50 percent plus one, or a two-thirds vote of the church conference will be required in order to leave the, the post-Methodist Church denomination or the denomination that the annual conference selects to stay with. 
Now it's important to, to understand that only members present and voting can, can vote at the duly called charge conference. If you're not a member, even if you've attended for 15, 20 years, you're not going to be able to vote as to what the future of this church does. So the choices under the protocol. One is you could, uh, there's going to be a new traditional church called the Global Methodist Church. There's already a new progressive church called the Liberation Methodist Connection. I'm already going one too far. Uh, the, and you, there'd be a post-separation United Methodist Church and potentially others. And it's important to note that in order to go independent, to be an independent church not associated with a new Methodist denomination, you would have to go through the current Book of Discipline ways of exiting the church. And we'll, I've got a little bit more on that later on. So the Global Methodist Church is, is a, will be a traditionalist uh, church that uh, will not allow LB, LGBTQ ministers of marriage they, there's no plan at present to have a trust clause. There won't be any jurisdictional conferences and bishops will not be lifetime appointments. The Liberation Methodist Connection is the new progressive denomination. Uh, it aims to center on the voices of people of color as well as queer and transgender transgender individual. It has no doctrinal, doctrinal litmus test, focuses more on actions and beliefs. Such actions include reparations, caring for the earth, free and Methodist tradition of colonialism, white supremacy, and so on. The post-separation Methodist church will likely be controlled by centrists and progressives after traditional members and, and clergy depart. It will likely repeal the, tradi the traditional plan legislation and all other portions of the Book of Discipline related to LGBTQ persons. It will be different than the Methodist Church as we know it today. And all three of these different uh, churches that I've described will be different than what it is today. So, an estimate, this is an estimate of demographics assuming the protocol is passed. And this is just one estimate. This one happens to be from a, a <coughs> guy named Mark Tooley, the president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy. He estimates two million members will likely leave for the new traditional uh, church. About four million will likely stay with the post-separation United Methodist Church or go with a new progressive church. He predicts Africa will go heavily with the new traditional church. And the others uh, will likely be 50-50. No one knows for sure what's going to happen. But this is just one estimate to kind of give you an idea of, uh, of what might come down the pipe. The option to go independent does not fall under the protocol. In other words, it's, it's a complicated, long, and expensive process. There's two ways you can do it. Book of Discipline, paragraph 2548, you can deed your church property to another uh, event, evangelical denomination. <coughs> Book of Discipline 2553, you can disaffiliate, disaffiliate 
must be about, approved by a vote of two thirds of the members. And there's five or six different groups within the Holston Conference that would get involved in telling you what you can, could, and couldn't do. Uh, you, and it, it, it would be an expensive, long, and complicated process is the point I was trying, I'm trying to make. We talked some about the trust clause. What is the trust, the trust clause? It states that the local church owns the property in trust for the benefit of the entire denomination. In other words, if St. Mark's decided they no longer today decided we no longer want to be the United Methodist Church uh, and we decided everyone of us decided to go form our own church uh, the property would go to the United Methodist Church and it could be sold or another church started or, or whatever uh, so the local a local church can't leave the United Methodist Church right now and retain their property now the original uh, purpose of the trust clause was to, to protect the church from teaching what was inconsistent with the will of the general conference and the historic doctrines of Christian faith. So I don't, I, I'm not sure that that's what it's being used for today, but that was the original purpose. Uh, in other words, if, if John Wesley went into a church and they were preaching some other doctrine other than the, the Methodist Wesleyan doctrine. He wanted the authority to remove that church and remove that pastor and put somebody in that church that would preach the doctrine that Methodists have. So what if the protocol is not passed? What's the alternative? Presently membership and attendance as well as financial support are declining. It's likely that separation will happen one way or the other it can happen in an orderly and relatively amicable way, or it can happen in a chaotic, costly, and bitter way. To continue like we're continuing, to me, is the classic definition of insanity, where you continue to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect different results. So with that, I guess Pastor Rowland will answer any of your questions. <laughs> so Tom, you don't have to sit down, but are there questions that my foot went to sleep and I can't? Get my balance. Are there questions you have? First, I think we should give time. Amen. Are there questions? Is there any organization that adheres to the West End doctrine? Are there other denominations that in here? Well, is there any organization within the Methodist Church that clings, I cling to the Wesleyan doctrine? That would, be, that would be organizations such as the Wesleyan Covenant Association, the uh, Good News Movement, which publishes, it's, it's not Good News Movement, it's Good News, Good News, I can't remember what they call themselves, uh, the Confessing Movement, and uh, there's one other. Oh, the Institute for Religion and Democracy. Those are all traditional Orthodox Wesleyan organizations within the United Methodist Church right now. And uh, 
uh, the Wesleyan Covenant Association is kind of the has become the clearinghouse for all of those in relationship to the negotiation of the protocol and and uh, and having a traditional voice, uh, a unified traditional voice. I would also add that the, the Wesleyan Covenant Association is taking the lead role in establishing this new global Methodist church. That's the tradition? Yes. Okay. So in the global church, how would that be structured? It would look a lot more like the pre-1939 structure, or? They actually have a, a, a draft book of doctrine and discipline. The structure is a lot like the United Methodist Church, but a lot less bureaucracy. Um, I've read something that said that if, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, they're not going to have a trust clause or no plans to have a trust clause at this moment. Their, their thought is if a local church doesn't get the benefit of belonging to that denomination, then they can leave any time with their property. But is their general conference then the ultimate yes. statement? Of, okay. Yeah, they, they would form a general conference and they would elect bishops for term limits rather than life. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the way I read the, it's called the Transitional Book of Discipline. You can go to the globalmethodist.org and find their Transitional Book of Discipline. That will, that will, the, their plan is to uh, launch the denomination as soon as the protocol is passed. And then within a few months after that general conference that passes the protocol, they'll hold it convening general conference where they will adopt a book of discipline and the transitional book of discipline is to see them through to that to that point um, but they the the transitional book of discipline calls for life not no lifetime bishops term limits on bishops and the use of presiding elders rather than district superintendents and that is a pre-1939 thing uh, a presiding elder um, served a church, was a district superintendent, but he, he or she served a church at the same time as being a district superintendent. And they envisioned that being possible because a lot of our DSs, uh, a lot of this, like the Knoxville, the Smoky Mountain district superintendent, they are on a lot of boards that are and committees that are related to the bureaucracy of the church. And the Global Methodist Church envisions a much leaner bureaucratic system that wouldn't that wouldn't entail all that so uh, they would serve a church and oversee other pastors so to me the core question is are we going to get rid of these ridiculous jurisdictional conferences is the global Methodist Church going to do that I understand that's that's the way the transitional book of discipline reads right now is that uh, bishops will be elected at the general conference and assigned by the general conference to the various annual conferences. So accountability is going to revert back to general conference, bishops, churches. Yeah. Everything is up to the convening conference. Whatever they decide there will be. I mean, that's probably what's going to be proposed. Um, and, 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 you know, um, Hindsight's always 2020. We can look back at the people who made those decisions in 1939, and, and certainly nobody wanted to go to church with black people. That was certainly part of that. Nobody wanted the the southern churches did not want to have a black bishop assigned to them from the north, and uh, uh, and we can we can say well that was just wrong that that wasn't right. And but you know we weren't there in 1939. We we don't. They were trying to get a deal done. They were trying to bring it, the unification of the church back. And, and so, you know, I don't know that it was done with uh, evil intent to put the organization the way it does. They, they put an organization together that everyone would buy into. And, you know, uh, and then the United Methodist Church basically adopted that when it merged in 1968. And, and we're discovering now that oh that 
It won't work. <laughs> yeah, it won't work. And, you know, and, and after the, after the, um, in uh, 20, I think it was 2012, no, it was 2016, jurisdictional conferences that typically meet, they meet every two years, and they meet before the general conference meets. And so in 2016, the Western jurisdiction of the United States elected an openly gay bishop, Bishop Olavito. And uh, uh, the Judicial Council was asked to rule on whether her election as bishop was constitutional. And the Judicial Council basically said, well, no, it, she violates the discipline by being elected as a bishop, but the Judicial Council said, we don't have the authority to tell the jur Western jurisdiction that they can't do that. Uh, they, the, 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 the jurisdictional conference has to deal with it, that bishop within that jurisdictional conference. Well, they elected her. They're not gonna, they're not gonna go back and say, okay, we're sorry, we're, we shouldn't have elected. And, and, and so the, the, the rule of accountability now, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a judicial council that said that will make decisions in line with the way the book of discipline reads now, but while they make that decision, they are powerless to enforce that decision, and that's what's created this impasse now. I've got kind of, kind of a question, and Anne's going to grab me and pull me down, but I'm going to stand up. First, I always like to think I'm the smartest person in the room, and I'm obviously not. Well, you are the second smartest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, really, I really appreciate Tom you going, going through this history and helping us out a lot, but and, and this just shows how little maybe I know and I'd hope to pick it all up tonight, but I'm probably going to come back and hear this again when you go again so that I can learn. But, you know, first of all, I was confused when we have a protocol that says reconciliation through separation. That threw me off because those seem like mutually exclusive terms. But my, my question is, your last slide was about the choices that we would have. If the, in the last slide said, if the protocol does not pass, our choices would be to stay in the United Methodist Church or pursue the independent withdrawal. Uh, and of course, the downside I suspect of staying within the United Methodist Church right now is they're a train wreck. Bishop, they're 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 not they're, they don't know what they're doing. You know, they're approving in some places, not approving in others. But where I think I'm missing, with respect to finally getting to my question. Uh, working the, uh, under the assumption that the protocol is going to pass because they have mediated it and working under the assumption that the people, the bishop, the 16 bishops that mediated are going to be men of their word and vote to support the protocol, is the basic question for us at that point then going to be the protocol passing and us being allowed or not to either go with the global or go with the traditional, will that, will that then, once the protocol passes, that, will that be the real decision that we have to make? Or stay with the post-separation United Methodist Church. Or stay with the post-separation United, okay. Well, the, uh, yes, sir, I understand. Terminology is, is key here, because you said go with the traditional or go yep. with the global, yeah, and that's, that's the same, same thing. That's the same oh, okay. thing. So okay. it's either go that's with the global missed. or remain with the United Methodist Church. Okay, yeah, I got my, that's what I say, I've got to come twice to even get the terminology right. <laughs> but, but ultimately, then that will be our question if the protocol passes, and will we as individual churches be able to vote and pick which one? Okay, and I and, and I know I've oversimplified. I, I've got to make it low enough for the goats to eat it, so I can understand at least a little bit of it. That's a famous Jesse Jackson line, by the way. Uh, you, you slept through that part of the presentation. Well, I tried. To, I tried to listen. Okay, but but uh, okay. I think my question is answered. At least for me personally, the big the big question is going to be how do I vote when and if the protocol passes, which if you're a, as we appear, if you're a if, member, right. I'll have to go to my old church and vote. I'm not a member here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Tom simplified that whole, what it, if the protocol passes, there's a, it's a rather complex process. Nothing's gonna be quick. Um, 
the uh, let's say let's say for sake of argument that the general conference does get held next September. Uh, I've heard conflicting reports. I've heard at, at our virtual session of the annual conference, the, the bishop made some statements and some other people made some statements that, that there was doubt whether that would be held because COVID cases in Africa are on the rise. And then I've read other articles that said that vaccinations in Africa are also on the rise and that vaccinations in the United States made a huge difference with COVID in just a matter of couple months and there's reason to think that Africa could do that as well and that they could be able to travel by uh, next September so it's still we, we hope it, it it's held but you know we don't know so but let's for sake of argument let's say it's held next uh, next September and uh, the protocol passes so what happens first well the decision making follows down the hierarchy of the, of the structure of the church. Annual conferences will have, I think, a year to make a decision about, and, and at that point, protocol passes. They are United Methodist Annual Conference. So if, if they make no decision, they remain a United Methodist Annual Conference. The only decision they would gather to make is to leave the United Methodist Church and join one of the other uh, post-separation denominations. So let's say the decision comes down to the annual conference and the an Holson Annual Conference says, we're staying with the United Methodist Church. They, and there's, in that case, there's no reason to hold a vote at, at their annual conference meeting. They do nothing. The default is to stay United Methodist Church. So the time... The time frame pass. Time frame goes, and annual conference Holston becomes an annual conference of the post-separation United Methodist Church. So then, uh, churches that disagree with the annual conference's decision or no decision, um, then have a decision to make. And so then they have a year after their annual conference decides. They have a year to decide if they're going to remain in the post-separation United Methodist Church or join one of the other denominations that have formed. Uh, and then, Just to be clear, the post-separation United, post United Methodist Church is ostensibly exactly the same United Methodist Church that we belong to today. Yes. But it will not stay that way. But it probably will not stay that way. But... For, for terminology purposes, when we say post-separation United Methodist Church, it is exactly the same structure, structure hierarchy, bureaucracy, and everything yes. else that we have this moment, today. Yes. yes. Until the traditionalists leave and they have a general conference where the trad traditionalists aren't there to vote, and they will rewrite the Book of Discipline in a totally different fashion than you say it today. Exactly. The way that process will work in the local church when it's t in, for the local church to make a decision, the church council will decide, will have a meeting and they will decide the threshold. So let's say our church council meets and says um, uh, that their decision, their choice would be to allow uh, the vote it would happen at a church conference. The church council will tell will tell the church count. Uh, <laughs> the church council will tell the church conference that they must vote by simple majority or by two thirds majority. And and so let's say our church council says we want to be fair, give everybody voice. And we're going to say we're going to pass this by two thirds. It must be passed by two thirds majority at the church conference. So, you know, there. So, a, a, a local church can have a church conference and it can have a charge conference. The difference between those two is that a charge conference, members of the administrative council are the voting members of the charge conference. At a church conference. Every pro, every professing member of the church has a vote. Has a vote. 
So this must be passed at a church conference, given the threshold set by the church council. And then it comes to the church council, church conference, and the question is put, uh, a motion typically would be made by somebody, and uh, once it's properly before the church council, church conference, uh, they would vote, and if, it, if the motion passes by two-thirds majority, then that, that's what would happen. Does that make sense? All these church council, church conference, make sure I'm trying to say the right thing. Nobody has acronyms like the United Methodist Church. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? Yeah. I think another, for me, uh, an item that took me forever to finally get figured out was this whole concept of the trust clause. It would be helpful, I think, if we explained clearly how church property, property is owned today versus how church property would be owned under the global Methodist Church. Okay. You want to take that one or you want me to? Well, right now the church property is owned by the denomination. Under the global Methodist Church, uh, until they have that convening conference, it's all based on a draft book of doctrine and discipline. But what I've seen is that there's no plan right now for the global Methodist Church to ever own any property. So the church would own it. The right. local church would own it. The church would own their church. The church would own their own property. Yes. But now there's there, there's going to have to be some like lawyers involved on how you get the deed transferred, and I'm sure there's going to be some very specific language that you'd have to put in the deeds and, and that type of thing. It's not going to be like like that. Tom, I think it might be important for you to explain that if we go with the protocol and we do decide to break apart and go with like the global, then we get to take our property with us, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then we will own it. Then we would own it. And that's and that's really you know, uh, I'm really trying to not to make I've not had any conversations with a large number of you about where you're what you think St. Mark's ought to do. So I'm trying real hard not to make any assumptions because I know what assumption assuming can do. But um, the 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 protocol is really, this is just my opinion, the protocol is the United Methodist Church's best, regardless of what side you're on, it's the best alternative to ending this 50-year stalemate. Uh, I mean, I, I just, it's time for us to quit fighting each other and arguing about this and get on with and, and have this. I, 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 I have been... I started attending annual conference when I was a senior in high school, junior in high school, as a, as a youth delegate. And so every annual conference since 1981 uh, has ended with, and, and as kids we thought it was always exciting because, okay, it's time for the petitions and resolutions. <laughs> and there was always some resolution about, uh, and then there, uh, about some issue of human sexuality and it would be debate, debated, and it would be, you know, er, people would sometimes get emotional. and some, But what I've, since 1981, since I've seen it, I've seen the debate and the issues get more intense, more divisive, and, and in the last several years, nobody's left annual conference, nobody's left jurisdictional conference, and nobody's left general conference happy. Uh, it has, it, everybody leaves all of those things with what's happening to our church. And it doesn't matter which side of the, the, the debate you're on. Everybody leaves what's happening to our church. What's happening to our denomination. What's happening to, this used to be a, a you know, annual, going to annual conference used to be a revival time. I mean, it was exciting. It, there was good preaching. There was hymn singing. There was, 
there was a, a lot of incitement, enthusiasm, and, and I've watched that simply evaporate over the years to the point where now um, nobody can, nobody, everybody dreads going and everybody can't wait to get out of there and, and say, I hope to have that's done for another year. And uh, it's, it's impeded uh, our enthusiasm as a denomination about the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. And uh, I think the protocols are, because, because if a church doesn't want to stay in a denomination that ordains and marries same, and, and has same-sex unions, then uh, there, there's no way for them to follow their conscience now without leaving their church behind. And, and, and I've been in enough churches, I know how much a building means to a church. And we could debate all day, well, maybe the building shouldn't mean that much to us. And you're probably right, it shouldn't. It's just a building. But we all love this building, don't we? I love it when Myrtle tells me that she remembers as a little girl cleaning those bricks off when, she, when the, they moved the building from down under the lake to here. And, and I know that this, it's brick and mortar, but uh, it means a lot to people that go here. Uh, and nobody wants to leave this building behind. Uh, and, and if it wasn't for the tr and and if it wasn't for the trust clause, we wouldn't have to. But that trust clause is there, and it's the way our church operates. Has and it was put in place for a good reason, but it's been it's now keeping churches from making that move that they that they to follow their conscience. And the, and and um, I'll say one more thing, and I'll hush. I want you to follow your conscience. I think your conscience should be informed by Holy Scripture, but I think you should follow your conscience just like I'm going to follow my conscience. Isn't the bottom line is the Word of God can't be changed? The Word of God is forever. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I, I think the Word of God is important. And, and I really think the debate really isn't about human sexuality. The debate, bottom line, is about uh, how uh, these camps that understand the role and purpose of Scripture. And, and I don't want to say that, uh, that I, I just believe differently than th some of the other groups do, and I don't want to, I don't want to badmouth them or anything because I, I'm tired of that. I, did, I don't want to argue with anybody anymore. I just, but I want, I want you to follow your conscience. I'm going to follow my conscience and, and stay true to what you have known to believe. Uh, Betty Ann, I saw your hand. Well, yeah. When you were talking about the, you know, the, the church and the building of the church following the congregation or whatever decision is made, what is, and, and this wasn't originally my thought, but I've really been doing some somersaults with it. I know that currently pastors are assigned to, to churches. When you go through the protocol and Know, St. Mark's Louisville Road, Louisville, you know, that, that's one entity. But what about the pastors? How does that work when the protocol, if it's passed, and there's a separation? Do pastors make a choice also? I mean, can it? Yes. Okay, so like if we chose global and you chose progressive, then you would not be our pastor anymore. Is that the way that That's works? correct. The thought right now in the global Methodist church is that the local churches would have a lot more influence on who their pastor would be. We may even could interview three or four people or possibly even go find someone not on the radar. Where if you've been involved now, the way pastors are selected, <laughs> they they say you have a choice. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> if you were a, not a 
remember. But you go here. Then you remember somewhere else and you maybe you just didn't, you got lazy, you forgot, whatever. Will there be a window of time for those people to act and transfer their membership or can they just not vote? I'd say they could vote up until the day of the church yeah, conference. There, you you, can, change you can transfer or join this church whenever you're ready. Uh, and uh, we would do that on a Sunday morning and you just tell me you want to join and uh, uh, and then as soon as you make the vows of membership, you you would be eligible to vote. Yeah. I have two questions. The one about the pastor placement. Would that would the global people provide that, a that pool? Group not place at all? You're responsible for finding your own group? No, the way I understand it, they would give you a pool okay. of several people. And you would have the opportunity to understand, uh, interview them. But as I said before, until they have that convening conference, everything is up for debate. And the other question I had was, it, um, assuming this protocol passes and the global church opens, is there a window of time to change a church from United Methodist to there? Is there a closing date? Three years, isn't it? Uh, three, three years from the end of the general conference that passes the protocol. Three years, okay. So there is if you read the protocol, it, it says it in there. I yeah. think it's three years. Okay. Yeah. One, one of the big concerns over this whole mess that that uh, people have voiced to me, uh, and, and not opening the, the political can of worms, but... Uh, people are genuinely concerned that churches that will tend to lean toward the traditional side uh, will not be welcoming toward members of the LGBTQ community. Is, is there something on the radar scope of the Wesley Covenant Association, the other members who are advocating for the traditionalist church, to make sure the LGBTQ community is fully aware that they are welcomed and loved in the conservative churches? Yes, there is. Uh, and, and there's. if you go to the Westland Covenant Association, westlandcovenant.org, and if you go to the globalmethodist.org, there's a couple of documents on that that kind of lay out that, you know, um, the stance on human sexuality and uh, the welcoming of LGBTQ people into worship and into... Uh, Methodist Church always welcomes. Amen. It's a good thing. I'm not a center anymore. I quit what I was doing. That's their problem. They just won't quit their sin. You can repent of sin all day, but you're going to live in that. I still sin. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm just that conservative. I believe that God said that uh, he, wants you, he wants you to have sex, to have people that are eligible to be um, members of his family in heaven. That's what sex is for. Every baby that's ever born has the opportunity to expand the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, it's, it's more involved than that. You just got to be there's a specific purpose for everything that God's created. And we're talking about a, a non-approved activity. Does that make everybody clear on what I <laughs> think we got it. Don't hold back, Bill. Go ahead. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, yes. Just, just one, just to clarify. So the global church administration really hasn't been formed yet and it will not be until they actually have a meeting. Right. And at that time then the traditional view will basically be followed. Maybe the pastors or a group of pastors will be suggested or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just be assigned as they are pretty much. At least the after it launches before there's a convening conference that may make any changes. It's a modif anybody been a part of a Episcopal church? Yeah, Episcopal churches have a, uh, Baptists have a call system. Yes. 
Baptist, when you lose a pastor in a Baptist church, you form a search committee and they go find a pastor and introduce, interview people. So that's a call system. The Episcopals have a modified call system. So they have an opening for a pastor. They tell their bishop. The bishop then says, well, here are some eligible pastors. Go look at these. And then the search committee or, or their committee, personnel committee goes, may interviews them, may hear them preach, and uh, 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 vets them. And then uh, they make a choosing. We like this guy or we like this lady. And then uh, they, I, I can't remember whether they go to the bishop to extend the offer to them, but the bishop has the approval of what they, of the person they make a choice of. And so it's a modified call system. And that's, that's kind of the system that the Global Methodist Church is looking at, talk, is talking about having for, that the bishop would, would, would not be, it's okay, St. Mark's, here's the pastor, take it or leave it. It would be more of a call system that, that involves the congregation much more than what is involved now. Possible. Yeah, possible. That, yeah, it, we're all, well, it's all question. theoretical. So, so do the, the other group that's already broken away from the church or the Liberty move, Movement as such, have they decided on how they will appoint their pastors? Yeah, I, I believe the Liberation Connection is already a functioning denomination. They've already broken away. Okay. They weren't happy with the, the aspects of the post-separation United Methodist and, or the traditional churches, and so they've already formed there. And I don't know how they their discipline. The, the, the last thing I... The last thing I read was they, they didn't have any doctrine. <laughs> any others? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank Tom for his hard work. Um, I understand that we may have lost a Facebook feed, but I think we're going to, uh, uh, I think I can upload a recording of this at least to YouTube, our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see Tom's presentation and give that to anybody. We also plan to have another one of these to capture anybody who wanted to come but couldn't come tonight. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Let me ask you one other question before you leave. I know you're ready to leave. Uh, if you would send me an email, uh, or write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to me. Are, th are there any other topics that either were in the tonight's presentation or other questions or things you think we as a congregation need to spend a session like this on? Is there something else you would need to know in order to be ready to make a decision? If you would send me an email, write it down on a piece of paper or something so that we can, I'll get with Tom and we'll figure out how what else we need to to do to give you information you need I have I have two thoughts I just want to leave you with if there's any if this church were to decide to go with a global Methodist church it would be it would behoove us to do so as soon as possible so that we would have a voice in the creation of the new denomination rather than wait until afterwards and accept whatever uh, the creationists uh, decide to do. The other point I'd like to leave you with is there's been millions of dollars and probably thousands of hours spent on this topic. One thing Mike Sluter said in the virtual annual conference uh, that really hit home with me is the biggest source of new churches in Africa are in the refugee camps. Now think about that. And I'll, that's the last thought I want to leave you with. Let me close this in prayer. Father God, the churches of Jesus Christ and will be preserved till the end of time for the due administration of the sacraments, for the preaching and proclamation of the word. It alone provides the grace that we all stand in need of. And we're thankful to be a part of your church. We pray that you would renew it, reform it, and fill it with your Holy Spirit. 
that we might be about the task you've given it to make disciples of all people, of all nations. And we are confident in your promise that you will be with us to the end of time. In your name we pray.